Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Uh, welcome to the SNS webinar. The first spe speaker for the, our session today is our honorable guest from Indonesia, Professor Asra Al Fauzi. Professor Asra is an associate professor of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Faculty of uh, Medicine, Ailanga uh, University, uh, Dr. Sotomo uh, General Hospital, Surabaya, Indonesia. He was the past General Secretary of the Indonesia Association Neurosurgical Specialists uh, Perspexy for the year 2017 to 2021 and General Secretary of the Asian uh, Neurosurgical uh, Society. In addition, he is also the current Chairman of the Surabaya Neuroscience Institute. His clinical interests are focused or upon uh, complex uh, brain tumor and cerebral vascular surgeries. He's a noted author with several publications in various peer review journals. He's also an invited faculty to various workshops and uh, conferences around the world. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar, and today he'll be talking about cranial keyhole surgery, past, present, and future. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Wang Zifeng. Professor Zifeng is an associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the first affiliated hospital of China Medical University, Shenyang. His clinical interests are focused upon endovascular neurosurgery. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar, and he'll be talking about anatomy, imaging, and endovascular treatment of early frontal branch. The chair for the first session today uh, is our honored guest from China, Professor Zubin. Professor Zubin is the Consultant Neurosurgeon at Huasan Hospital Fudan University, China. He's a world-renowned cerebral vascular surgeon and also the Vice President of the ACNS. He's a proponent of global neurosurgery and is also a torch bearer for online education for the young neurosurgeon. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the first session of today's webinar. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honor guest from Japan, uh, Professor Yochi Morofuji. Professor Morofuji is an associate professor at the Department of Neurosurgery at the Nagasaki University School of Medicine, Japan. His clinical interests are focused upon endovascular neurosurgery. He has published several various uh, articles in various uh, peer review journals. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome to both speaker and chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of SNS uh, webinar. Uh, also, a warm welcome to our colleague in China, and we are extremely thankful to our chairperson, uh, Professor Zubin, for broadcasting this webinar on WeChat channel. With that introduction, I will hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Zubin. Professor, please. Okay, thank you, Professor Liu. And, uh... Uh, let's welcome Professor uh, Asra El Fossi, and uh, uh, he is talking about a very important uh, uh, approach, the cranial keyhole surgery, the past, present, and the uh, future. I think this is a very important uh, aspect for the minimal uh, invasive neurosurgery. And uh, even uh, myself, I also try to do some keyhole bypass. Okay, Professor Fozzi. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Bichu, my best friend, and also uh, Dr. Liu, and uh, Professor uh, Wen, and also Morofuji Sensei. Uh, nice to meet you all. <laughs> and uh, allow me to share my thank you. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an honor for me to you know, uh, share some experience and maybe uh, we can share knowledge too in this very uh, valuable uh, webinar in ACNS webinar uh, series. And this time I will uh, talk about cranial key surgery. You know, it's very, you know, very uh, popular uh, technique and now is uh, you know uh, growing you know many uh, neurosurgeon especially young neurosurgeon want to study about this but uh, you know uh, in my experience uh, there are some issues that we have to understand before uh, 
we start to use this uh, uh, approach. And uh, yes, this is very important milestone, I think. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the term of gill surgery, especially in neurosurgery, was already mentioned a long time ago in 1971. Uh, Donald Wilson, uh, you know, uh, in his article in Journal Neurosurgery in 1971, uh, report, uh, you know, uh, his approach to, to doing this minimally invasive uh, approach. But this is important that the philosophy uh, that time is very different because the idea behind, behind this approach was not a simply a matter of, you know, limiting the size of the limiting of the retraction, nothing, but what, but was based on the principle that a small canotomy could be rapidly open and closed. And you know, that time, uh, uh, neurosurgery, uh, of course, using the confessional approach, you can see in the, the other picture, even uh, only uh, we use that uh, very small operative view, but uh, usually we open uh, a big craniotomy and uh, opening all the dura. So you can see the retraction of the brain is always used that time. And uh, yes, of course, uh, I think mm, before we know many advanced tools, advanced uh, you know, advanced uh, technology in neurosurgery. Sometimes, uh, you know, we uh, use some approach that usually is not a vision anymore. If we compare with this situation, that time we use, you know, we make a, a big craniotomy, opening all the dura, even only, uh, you know, uh, try to focusing in some small, uh, you know, some small pathology in the brain. So I, I think, you know, uh, recently, I think uh, we cannot doing this any, anymore because we have many technology, good, you know, equipment, surgery tool and other things. Yeah. Yes, uh, the, the important thing of the keyholes concept is uh, this is a you know uh, of course this is a minimal invasive approach yeah and of course uh, of course about the technique this approach is different from the standard keratoma because we always use a smaller skin incision and smaller bone window but the principle is not about this yeah the 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 philosophy behind this procedure is how we can limit it tissue exploration and also the minimal brain protection to minimize the complication of our surgery. So this is the philosophy behind this, uh, this approach. And actually, uh, mm, some report uh, already, you know, uh, published in a uh, journal a long time ago, you can see in 1997, I think you already know Professor Joe from uh, Pittsburgh that uh, uh, he report about, uh, you know, uh, they call it orbital roof craniotomy with eyebrow incision. So that time he report his ideas about doing uh, the, the, you know, the minimalistic approach for some, uh, you know, skull based uh, pathology using this uh, kind of minimalist approach. And he said that uh, this approach could um, minimize the, the time or the timing of the operation. And also, you know, the patient can discharge uh, uh, the, the, from the hospital earlier. And also some, you know, report of the minimal uh, complication of uh, his surgery. Also, we know Axel Pernesky. I think uh, uh, this, you know, the, the this uh, neurosurgeon, you know, he's very 
popular uh, you, using the minimally invasive surgery with the eye brush kinesthesian and his book you know his textbooks is uh, becoming some kind of bible in our uh, neurosurgery field and robert race is uh, you know his successor is until now is still doing this with some you know some modification and also some uh, uh, new strategy using this minimal minimal invasive approach and uh, yes actually you can see on this uh, picture that uh, the basic principle of uh, using this approach in micro surgery i mean in surgery is the standard craniotomy forms a final shape surgical corridor to reach deeper area of the brain in contrast keyhole mini craniotomy forms a reverse final shape surgical corridor that provides adequate working space through a small incision and bone window to reach target. So actually, uh, mostly uh, the area of some pathology in the brain could be, uh, you know, uh, performed this approach. Of course, uh, with some, you know, uh, good indication uh, you know uh, how to choose the the good candidate for a good candidate patient to this to uh, this approach is very important because not all uh, patient or not all uh, kind of the two kind of disease uh, could be you know uh, perform this approach with this approach. Yeah, so you can see again. So. Uh, we can uh, replace the, the approach with this uh, uh, strategy of uh, keyhole surgery, even in the deeper area of the brain, usually uh, uh, we can do with this small corridor of, the, of our surgery. Yeah. Because you can see the intercanal optical field widens with increasing distance from the craniotomy flat. So even the deeper area of the brain, uh, it should be managed by this approach. Yes, uh, uh, like uh, I uh, said earlier, that the, the concept of the keyhole is not about size. This is very important. For example, if you, if you try to uh, decreasing your incision, decreasing your, uh, you know, the, the width of your craniotomy uh, to be, you know, smaller. So you already, you know, applied the keyhole concept in your surgery. Yeah. So this is important because uh, the important thing is how you, the philosophy you're trying to, you know, you're trying to, uh, uh minimize the the tissue uh, uh, destruction to minimize the uh, brain uh, retraction brain exploration so uh, this is the concept of the keyhole that you're trying to perform to decrease the the complication after surgery yes uh yes this is uh Actually, what I'm doing in my hospital that uh, very important how you to use the candidate for uh, this approach. For example, I think not all the aneurysm case suitable for uh, this kind of approach. I think I always use the 3D CTA surgical simulation to you know to uh, uh, have a preoperative uh, planning to uh, to choose uh, what is the candidate the best candidate for this approach so it's very important uh, in my experience I, I'm not you know I'm not apply the <laughs> kill surgery for or aneurysm or tumor case so I'm just trying to uh, explain that I will show you uh, some cases that uh, for me I think, 
uh, this, uh, that case is best uh, uh, to you know to perform by uh, the keyhole surgery. Yes, uh, you ca you can see uh, the instrument is very important. Uh, maybe uh, you know uh, this that is a, a LASIK instrument that a malleable applicator a clip applicator uh, for you know for aneurysm surgery and i use the this kamiyama uh, uh, scissors and also sometimes uh, some uh, surgeon use uh, assisted uh, endoscopy but i'm not doing uh, perform this in my hospital uh, and of course high magnification microscope is very important yeah so recently many many uh, you know many uh, this uh, company uh, try to develop um, tools surgery surgical tools for this uh, minimally invasive surgery so because uh, this approach is uh, uh, you know more popular and many uh, neurosurgeon try to uh, use this approach in their daily practice yes as you know there's many uh, uh, before some conventional uh, uh, approach of uh, operation uh, so now is you know some is shifted to the uh, keyhole strategy like this one for uh, subfrontal craniotomy we use the we use we use the keyhole eyebrow approach and yes uh, conventional retrosomic approach we can do it by the keyhole keyhole subtemporal keyhole superstar and many yeah and also of course keyhole paternal approach Yes, uh, I just want to show you that even in another specialist in the medical field, they are trying to use this uh, 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 minimalist approach uh, in their field. Yeah. Uh, as you know, uh, the endoscopic surgery and also uh, endovascular approach uh, in neurosurgery is becoming popular but you know that not all uh, the cases uh, can be done by that approach so sometimes uh, uh, we still need the surgery open surgery to you know to uh, treat uh, some kind of you know disease but we can do by minimal invasive surgery so the the answer will be this uh, this uh, uh, keyhole strategy, especially in cranial keyhole surgery. And yes, I know you 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 already know how is the difference of the incision and uh, how is the difference of uh, craniotomy for this approach. Yeah. Yes, uh, like this. Yeah. You can see that uh, I used it uh, lazy clip. Maybe uh, I don't know in some part of the world uh, use this uh, uh, clips too because it's very good for the uh, minimally invasive uh, in aneurysm surgery. And you can see this patient is discharged from the hospital the day of three. So some of the advantage of this approach is, you know, uh, how uh, fast the patient can discharge from the hospital. And this surgery was done in 2009, a long time before. Yeah. And also, uh, this is also a candidate. Uh, I will show you some short movie. I use this uh, cure surgery uh, with eyebrow incision. So we can turn it on the uh, usually two and a half centimeter length. Yeah. Uh, we can see that we can reach the frontal blaze easier and we can see the, the you know, uh, optic nerve there. And yes, easier to 
know, the neck of the aneurysm there. So PICOM is there, you can see. And uh, yes, uh, uh, and then we can uh, precisely um, clip the neck of the aneurysm. So I just want to show you that uh, some cases, even uh, tumor or aneurysm of, or another uh, uh, disease can be treated with this approach uh, with a good outcome. And yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, very important message to young neurosurgeon is, you know, that uh, you know some some uh, some neurosurgeon uh, perform uh, this keyhole craniotomy and some uh, complex cases. But uh, in this presentation, I just want to show you that I think uh, in the future some. Uh, it's not a simple case, but I think uh, some cases should be managed by uh, this kind of approach. For example, this is a, a patient with retro-obsal pain. You can see uh, this indication for operation, operation. And I think the position and the size of the tumor is not very, very, uh, uh, very large. And I think it's uh, approachable to uh, use this uh, keyhole surgery, I think, supra approach for this kind of uh, uh, tumor. So I want to show you that uh, I think most of the uh, neurosurgeon can do this, you know. So, like usual, now we go for subfrontal approach you can see yes we just uh, uh, take out the tsf then the brain is more relaxing there so we can detach uh, the tumor base from uh, the the uh, Frontal base, you can see. Yes, I think uh, this is uh, one of the uh, candidate that you know that should be managed by this approach. You can see we can uh, detach totally the tumor, in the cartilage. So yes, I just want to show you that. Uh, uh, this approach is really, uh, you know, have a good, good uh, uh, advantage uh, to treat this uh, patient with this small uh, frontal base uh, uh, tumor. And for the keyhole general approach, you can see how the different of the incision, because we only need some small craniotomy there. And this is the, for example. For, this is a, a small, I think, small MGA bifurcation aneurysm with history of rupture before from another hospital and, you know, uh, uh, refer to our hospital. I think Professor Juha uh, does, uh, doing this uh, many cases with this, uh, you know, uh, keyhole lateral orbital approach or paternal approach. Okay, like usual, we can see. So, yeah, you know, we can see clearly, and this is the bifurcation. You can see this is, a, I think, it's a very small uh, aneurysm there. You can see this, uh, we can see the neck of the aneurysm there. I think, uh, yes, uh, we can doing, we can do this uh, uh, MCA before question aneurysm with the small crown tumor. And I think the aneurysm is a thrombotic one. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes. And then uh, we put the clip there. I use this lazy clip to uh, 
close the neck of the aneurysm. Yes. I will uh, sure and yes, because it's a traumatic one, we can cut the dome of the aneurysm. So this is another example uh, how the uh, keocardiomy can you know, safely and efficiently uh, uh, perform for this such case of the aneurysm case. And uh, yes, uh, Yes, now uh, this is uh, another uh, approach that uh, we should uh, try to, uh, you know, to perform in some cases. And uh, for example, for uh, uh, hemifacial spasm or trichomonorrhea, in our experience, all uh, we can uh, do by this approach. Maybe another small tumor in the CPA tumor, I think uh, we can uh, uh, do with this too. So this, I just want to show you that uh, actually, uh, in my opinion, for all the case of the microvascular, I mean, uh, microvascular decomposition surgery, should be uh, minute with this uh, small approach in retrosomoid. Yeah, you can see uh, only a small corridor of the uh, uh, craniotomy and also the opening to dura. But uh, we can move our microscope, uh, you know, to uh, choose the 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 ideal uh, operation view. To uh, focus on that object, we try to you know to reach. You can see that we can see clearly how the seven nerve and the uh, you know uh, vascular attached to this uh, root and zone. So you know we can clearly with that small uh, corridor, you can uh, manage this case. So yes, yeah, so we put the Teflon there. Yeah. And okay, so yes, we can uh, do it nicely there. Yeah, and put the fibrin glue. So uh, yes, uh, I'm not showing all the case, but uh, I just to I just want to show you that uh, this is the future uh, of the the future uh, of the middle invasive in uh, cranial surgery that uh, I think we should, uh, you know, we should uh, perform for some cases. Yeah. And uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, there is a strict indication also, there is some advantage also, there's also some disadvantages but I think uh, I just want to show you some advantage of this cranial field surgery. Shorter surgical procedure, less injury to the cranial muscle, and also uh, require only one buffer, so minimizing poor cosmetic appearance. And of course, less brain detection and faster recovery. Yes, uh, the other thing is, uh, 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 for eyebrow surgery, uh, usually it's cosmetic surgery. So the important thing is how we can, you know, manage the incision in the eyebrow. So uh, the result will be good for the patient too. So it's, we have to understand this too, how we can uh, manage the cosmetic result in the, in the face. Yes, there is some limitation of course so uh, for young neurosurgeon is very important that uh, uh, we have to choose a good candidate for this approach because if you decide uh, to use this uh, approach in your surgery you cannot go back 
So please uh, try to make a good preparation, good preparation, preoperative uh, preparation uh, on each cases. Yeah. So uh, yes, uh, is rely on the surgeon experience too, and also use some uh, good uh, you know microsurgery instrument, a good microscope. Yeah, and another uh, in, uh, limitation. Yeah. Yes, uh, the future of this keyhole is uh, yes. The general trend in neurosurgery has been minimally invasive technique with smaller openings, aided with improved technology and instrumentation. The goal of our surgery is to reach the optimal outcome with the least of um, risk of risk possible. Nowadays, keyhole surgery are more feasible than before because of advances in high tech tools and techniques. So yes, this is our future. Yeah. And of course, uh, yes, uh, uh, before uh, I, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, try to use this uh, approach in our hospital, there is some uh, counter argument here. Yeah. Uh, the result from standard approach are good. Why we should change this usual manner? Yes, of course. Like I uh, uh, said before, that you know, there is some advantage of this approach because uh, we can do this because now the technology is uh, getting better in our neurological field. So I think yes, for some cases we can uh, use this uh, approach. The keyhole surgery needs specific instrument and difficult to learn. Uh, I think, yes, it needs specific instrument. But I think uh, now uh, the this instrument is, you know, uh, widely used by uh, many countries, many neurosurgeons. So it's not uh, impossible anymore. And it's not difficult to learn. Please go to, uh, you know, master of this and then uh, choose the good candidate choose the uh, uh, good indication so uh, you can uh, do it better and with with optimal result it's better to sacrifice tissue and bone rather than brain so i think uh, recently yeah our uh, our philosophy is yeah not only the brain uh, we should try to minimize uh, the deduction of the tissue and also the bone I mean, in the cranial surgery, yeah. And uh, yes, uh, the principle, I think it's not a counter argument, but uh, this is a message yeah, that that principle and technique of kill surgery must begin to be taught correctly to resident because this technique is a future of nerve surgery. In certain cases, cranial surgery can be a standard approach to our daily practice, like I so uh, so to you uh, some cases earlier. Cure surgery is a constant process of evolution. We should continually try to perform less destructive and more thoughtful approaches in our surgical practice. I think uh, uh, that's all my presentation. I hope uh, it give a benefit uh, to you all, especially to uh, uh, our young neurosurgeon. Thank you very much, Professor Binsu. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you for your very informative uh, presentation. Yeah. And uh, here's a uh, question from Dr. Ahmed uh, Fami. Did you open oh, oh, yeah. frontal sinus in eyeball approach and how to manage it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Fahmi. So uh, actually, uh, uh, for me and, uh, and also many uh, experts say, if uh, the patient have a big uh, frontal sinus, so uh, it's better we we try to avoid use this uh, approach. But if there's a small frontal sinus, and of course we uh, we open this, if the frontal mucosa is intact, so it's okay. But if uh, if uh, we uh, you know open the uh, the mucosa of the frontal sinus, we, we, uh, yes, we have to manage this. You know, 
we have to uh, some uh, some uh, sometimes you have to you know, you know suture the mucosa or we can you know close with other flap peris uh, peristim for example to uh, prevent the infection yeah so we have to manage that Dr. Fami. yeah but if uh, the patient have a big frontal sinus to, so I avoid to use this uh, 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 eyebrow approach because the risk of the infection is getting higher. I think that's uh, that's uh, Dr. Fami here. Yes, I noticed that you already point out in your presentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For for this uh, personalized uh, surgery. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And I think Dr. Liu. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably I have one question for you, Prof. Uh, uh, so yeah. uh, is yeah. the positioning of the patient part of the concept of a uh, keyhole surgery? I mean, uh, putting uh, uh, in a position where you don't need uh, so much of retraction, is it part of the Yes. yes. Uh, you know, if you... Uh, if you try to perform this uh, uh, keyhole surgery, position is very important. So uh, I think uh, you uh, you know I, I have resident, but I have better to you know positioning by myself because uh, you know uh, with that small corridor, so the position of the surgeon is well also very important. You know how to uh, you know uh, uh, use the microscope. You know. Uh, for positioning because we have small corridor very important and also uh, we use some uh, you know some uh, specific instrument you know that uh, very you know um, uh, only only surgeon only me uh, uh, know how to use that instrument so especially in some uh, experience or surgeon doing this minimally uh, invasive keyhole surgery Say positioning is very important. So please, uh, you know, position by yourself, <laughs> not by resident. Yeah. Then you okay, uh, Astra. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I noticed that you uh, doing this uh, keyhole approach in some uh, emergency aneurysm case. Do you have some? Uh, did you have some experience about the intraoperative rupture? Uh, yeah. Yeah. condition uh, yeah. you know actually uh for aneurysm surgery i'm not doing in acute fase uh uh professor binsu okay some some uh, cases that i you know i uh, uh saw you in the case it's, they, they have a history of rupture yeah so refer to another still usually uh one week or two weeks after the first yeah so uh uh, uh, I have I have no experience uh, for the uh, you know interoperative rupture. Uh, also, uh, you know uh, I uh, made a perioperative uh, uh, imaging very carefully. So I choose <laughs> the the best candidate uh, for you, for this. In my experience, maybe only ten or twenty percent of cases that I use this. Yeah. Because in my hospital, uh, more than uh, ninety-five percent all the cases is a rupture case. Professor Binsu, <laughs> okay. we have small one of unrupture. So <laughs> I, I I have to choose the best candidate for this approach. Yeah, thank you, Professor Binsu. Okay, yeah. Doctor uh, Ben. Yes. Hello, hello, yeah. Professor. Uh, professor. Uh, hello. Chief. Yeah. Hello. Also, Doctor Liu, uh, and also uh, Professor. Uh, uh, that's just nice to meet you all. I'm just uh, uh so, sorry for the full connection. I'm just on on my way back from the Thai, from the ICAT in Taiwan, and uh, okay. it's, it's so good to uh, listen to your lecture again about the concept of uh, minimally invasive surgery. Yeah. So uh, I really enjoy it. I have two questions. The first yeah. question is about uh, the for the superorbital ap approach, the wound. Yeah. So. Uh, for those uh, patients with a less prominent uh, eyelid, uh, uh, eyebrow, uh, less prominent yeah. eyebrow, would you, uh, if the tumor is still uh, 
accessible with minimally invasive approach, uh, would you would you still use uh, the eyebrow incision or you will use a uh, uh, conventional open approach or yeah. you will choose another incision, for example, lead crease incision or other approach uh, uh, or other eye incision? My second question is about uh, uh, the importance of the CSF uh, release. And um, the, uh, do, you have, do you encounter cases where there is a um, uh, very uh, tight brain that you, that you want to release uh, CSF, but uh, you haven't reached the system yet? Uh, will you use the EVD or use the lumbar chain uh, PIOP um, to prevent this condition to happen? Thank you so much. Yeah. Professor. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Professor Ben. Yeah. Uh, first question, yes. As I mentioned earlier, uh, minimally, minimally invasive surgery, especially eyebrow surgery, uh, its uh, cosmetic result is very important. Yeah. This is, uh, I want to, uh, I think, uh, uh, show you in the, the previous uh, slide. So if, you know, the, you know, the eyelid is uh, not appropriate. I think <laughs> you know what yes. I mean, yeah. So I'm not used yeah. <laughs> this. So okay. I use, uh, use conventional, like conventional yeah. yeah. Because you know, uh, we can we can you know hide the incision if they have uh, you know <laughs> very bold eyelid. Yes. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, I I know what I mean. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this is the first question, and and the second, yes. Of course, uh, for aneurysm surgery, sometimes I use the lumbar drain to decrease. Yeah, but uh, I just show you that the one of contraindication doing this uh, 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 minimal surgery, especially eyebrow approach, is the the patient with a massive brain edema. Uh, as you know, I never doing some case in acute phase. So I uh, always avoid to uh, you know to use this approach in with patient with massive brain edema. So it's not good candidate. <laughs> so please mm -hmm. try to avoid with a uh, patient with uh, uh, brain edema. I think it's very difficult to use this approach. I think that's all, Doctor Ben. Yeah. I hope. Thank it, you so much. Clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> and I uh, so yes. glad to meet you all again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, then Dr. Liu. Yeah. Okay. So now let's move to the next speak. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Mm. Thank you, Professor Subin. Uh, now I would like to call upon Professor Moro Fuji uh, to invite our second speaker, Professor. Okay, so let's move on the second lecture. Uh, it's a great honor for me to chair this session. I'm Dr. Moro Fuji from Nagasaki University, Japan. Today we have Professor Wen Zifen from the first hospital of China Medical University in China. Professor Wen Zhen is specializing in interventional diagnosis and treatment of neurovascular diseases, and he's taking care of more than 200 operations per year. Today, uh, Professor Wen Zhen is going to talk to about the anatomy, amazing, and endovascular treatment strategy of early frontal branch. The title is focusing on the early frontal branch, which is very attractive. Uh, Professor Wen Zifin uh, will present his wide and vascular experience. Could you start your lecture when you are ready, Professor? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Morifi. Uh, hello, everyone. It's my great honor to have this opportunity to learn from so many famous neurosurgeries. This meeting is very meaningful for me. Uh, this is my first academic exchange in English. I hope we all have a happy start together. Uh, thank you, Professor Yi and everyone. Now let's uh, start my report. And uh, my report is anatomic radio project and the surgery treatment of the early front branch aneurysm. Uh, first, I show two cases. Case one, left carotid angiogram demonstrate an aneurysm originating from 
M1 segment brain. And the CT obtained on the third day following surgery ray demonstrate infraction. And the case two, right carotid and APV demonstrate on the aneurysm origin from M1 segment branch. And the CT obtained on the sixth post operation date demonstrate infraction. What happened to the case? Uh, we know the MCA. MCA equal middle cerebral artery. MCA is the largest and the most compressed of the cerebral arteries. And it from the internal carotid artery on the middle aspect of the lateral fissure, inferior to the anterior performing substance. Yes, this is M1. And the, the MCA is divided into four segments, maybe five, M1 to M4. M1 is phenotyl segment, is horizontal segment, and the M4 is your segment, and the M3 is ocular segment. M4 of M5 is terminal segment. M2 and M3 combined serial segment is serial segment. Uh, the M1 segment begins the origin of the MCA at the medial end of the serial fusion, lateral to the optic tract and the posterior to the division of the artifact tract into medial and the lateral artifact strata. An M1 segment across lateral below the anterior perforate substance toward the insulin. And the M1 segment terminal at the lumen insulin where the artery begins, begins a 90 turns known as the gene by curving sharply posterior superiorly to form the M2 segment, which is composed the trunk causing over the insulin. Uh, the main trunk of the M1 segment ending in the bifurcation in 88% of the hemisphere. This is the superior trunk and the inferior trunk is M1 terminal. And the main trunk of the M1 segment end in a threefurcation in 10% of the hemisphere. This is here, superior trunk, middle trunk, and the inferior trunk. And the, the length of the main trunk of the M1 segment and the MCA bifurcation in 50 hemispheres. The length of the pre bifurcation part of M1 cement is 17.82 M. Range 10 point its orange was 3.71 mm, range 2.742, 4.92. Another early branch is the carotid artery, a ring from the main M1 trunk proximal to the bifurcation of trifurcation was named the early branches by Klumper in 1962. And so the early branches was defined as the cortical arteries, 
arising from the main trunk or the middle cerebral artery, proximal to its bifurcation or bifurcation. So the early brain was corrected according to their size and the pattern of orange diameter relative proximity to the ICA bifurcation and the number of the lenticular straight branches. So the M1 segment have the early frontal branches. The early front branch EFB terminal on the front or front label, front label. And the early temporal branch ETB terminal on the temporal label. So the mean distance between the ICA bifurcation to the orange of the early branch was 9.86 mm range, 4.57 to 22.427 mm. So the M1 segment contained ETB of EFB. A distinction of early branch of MCA in 50 hemisphere. A total of 16 EFB was identified in 50 hemisphere. The main distance between the ICA bifurcation and the EFB was 11.1 mm, and the mean diameter was 1.41 mm. There was not there was no correlation between the diameter of the EFB and its proximity to the orange of MCA. And the EFB, this is the front robot. The front ocular has been retracted to expose the insurer. The cost of the orbital front and the front front arteries is the front artery and the plate front artery arise, arising from a common trunk. The single my trunk of MCA gives rise to and the ETB and the EFB. The temporal branches arise more proximally than the EFB. The EFB arising from the M1 segment passed upwards, forwards, and the somewhat lateral toward the anterior super portion of insurer. And the EFB bifurcation into op, orbit front and the prefer front artery at the level of the transgenerous of the insurer. The opt front artery cross along the anterior limited circuits of the insurer before ascending to supply the inferior portion of the part of orbital. The early front branch origin from segment, M1 segment, and the early temporal branch arranging from the distant uh, M1 segment, the M1 bifurcation occurring at a level of genium and the lumen in zero. The lenticular straight eight arteries arising from the proximal portion of the early front branch and the prefrontal artery across along the interior short insurance genius to reach the junction of the anterior and the superior 
rear limbers of the limited insular suckers wade cross lateral, lateral near the interior horizontal ramus of the cerebrum feather to supply the superior aspect of the pass orbital pass trigeris and most of the middle front gyrus. And this orbital front artery allows from the EFB and the pass upward, forward, and the somewhat lateral to reach the anterior super part of the insula, where they put branch to transient and access insulin drainage and the, the, the adjects interior limiting the sex of insulin. And the, the MCA branch let uh, penetrate the anterior perforate substance as uh, known as the lenticular artery. Artery. And the uh, lenticular 38 arteries usually arising from the proximal portion of the early branch. And the EFBS gives rise to more RSA as per vessel than ETBs. And the uh, RSA is typical arising from posterior and the post the superior and the superior aspect of early branch, the cause of the SAS arranging from early branch, superior to entering the anterior and perforate substance was longer than the cause, than the cause loss arranging from the bifurcation part of M1 seg segment. It means this SRA is long than the rolling from M1 segment. And uh, the EFBS give rise to one to three carotid arteries. And the orbital and the prefront arteries. The early brain to the front robot arose as the common trunk and the gill rise to cortical branch. And the lenticular straight eight artery that arose from the EFBS tend to arrange from the interior one CM of the early branch. This is S. RSA and the orbital front artery and the plate front artery. And the distribution of the 133 cortical arteries arranging from the early branch of the MCA in 50 hemispheres, we see the front rope orbital front artery is 16, and the prefrontal artery is four, and the precentor is one. So orbital front artery is contains 76.2% and the prefrontal artery is 19%. So the single Presenter artery arrives from uh, the EFB arranging from the tribification of a common trunk of and the EFB along with orbital and the prefrontal arteries. The sole uh, anatomic feature of the RSAs in 50 hemispheres and the road. 7.6% of the EFBs, but 11.3% of the from the ETBs, but the EFBs give rise to more RSAs per visit than 
ETBs, a means of 2.76 per average, and compare with a means of 2.28. The RSA usually arising from the proximal portion of the early branch. Edge curve. And this is the APV, a single main trunk or MSC arising in no early branch, but we can see a large RSA arising from the before pre focacial M1 segment. And this is the, the ETB arising as a common stand and rising to multiple cortical arteries like this. And uh, this is the main bifurcation is located at the lumen areas. And this is the before pre bifurcation M1 segment give rise only one early front branch arteries and the terminal terminate in the front air. And the have under the main bifurcation of the MCA is located lumen gene. And they like this photo. And this is the before the pre bifurcation M1 segment give rise to one ETB and one EFB, which the ETB begin, begin closer to the ICA bifurcation than EFB. The ETB arrives as a common trunk and the bifurcation before reaching the air of the lumen and the bifurcation of M. CA is located at human near the gene, like this. And the same pattern of early branch can be seen in this AP view. The proximary early branch terminal in temporal air under the distal early branch terminal in frontal air. And the main bifurcation is located near the gym. And this is the pre-bifurcation M1 segment give rise to only one ETB and one EFB. The EFB is in this group is closer to the I say bifurcation, larger in diameter and has multiple cortical arteries. The pre bifurcation M1 segment divide into superior and inferior trunk near the gym. And the, the nature cause of the and wraps your cerebral annual in Japan. Uh, this is the 6,697 annuals I studied. 91% was covered in incident. We see 2,425 middle cerebral arteries is the most percent, 36%. And uh, they show the MCA aneurysms has classical been described as occurring at one of six locations. And uh, the bifurcation of M1 segment, two is the M1 trifurcation segment, and three is the take of the Lenticular 3 atrial arteries 
for the branch side of M1 segment temporal arteries and five, the M1 front branch arteries. And six, this tail side on the M2, M3, and the M4 segments. And the 100, including MCA and region, they found 36 M1 bifurcation aneurysm and 39 early front branch aneurysm, 18 early temporal branch aneurysm, and four lenticular straight arteries aneurysm, and three M1 trifurcation aneurysms. Uh, this is a clinical and radiologic characterized by MCA and original location. And original size M1 to 2 is means 4.7 mm range 3.6 to 6.3 mm. And the, the E FB means 3.6 and the range 2.9 to 4.7 mm. And the, the media aneurysm size and the side radio was smaller in EFB aneurysm than M1 and the M2 aneurysms. And the Marty Morphological regression and analysis of factor of each logic compared with M1 and M M2 aneurysm and the uh, university and the variety variety logic recent regression analysis for MCATI. Uh, MCATI equal mid middle cerebral artery terrible territory infections from two tables with EFB MCATI is percent 38 was second higher in EFB aneurysm land in ETB and the amount of clinical and the radiologic characteristics evaluated. Only EFB location was related to MCATI. And the sum, summary of middle cerebral artery and recent characteristics. And the reason type is bifurcation, trifurcation, early front branch, early temporal branch and the lenticular straight artery branch. The subtypes as dystonic was regard to location, distance from the internal carotid artery bifurcation. And the 85 projection of down to frontal labor. Front to label. And uh, most of the list 39 early front branch and region projected superior toward front label in AP view. And the 33 of the 33 of 39 and the reason project front 84 percent, 6.0%. And the six was in line with the Silovian fusion. And the no early front branch and reason project inferior to wall temporal robe. And the in the latter, angiography print 11 early front branch aneurysms projected 
projected anteriorly and four project posterior. 10.3% and 24 was neutral 61.5%. This EFB aneurysms toward frontal rubber. And difficulty, surgery of the early front branch aneurysm, uh, the short M1 segment, very short M1 segment, and uh, the take of the M1 segment front branch is often acute, approaching 90 degree. And uh, the aneurysm neck is often incorporated into the proximal portion of the early front branch. And the early front branch aneurysm project superiorly. Rare bifurcation aneurysms tend to project down the line of the cervian's fusion. It would result in premature rubs given the projection of the dome. And the, the recurrent RSA arteries that arise from the proximal portion of the early front branch cause directly behind the aneurysm dome and the net, neck. And the, the early front branch RSA has arteries cause inferior in rust to the anterior perforate substance and the light deep to the aneurysm net and the zone. Uh, so they subject the begin the future sleep spirit laterally and again to avoid the front rubber retraction that would be required to split front proximal to lateral and the lateral fusion is split down to the level, level of the lumen insula where the bifurcation is identified and the, the dissection is then carried out along the M1 segment, avoid the superior surface of M1 segment where the aneurysm net arises. And the, in, enough M1 segment is exposed to a long temporal clipping before any front rubber retraction. That may be required to completely complete the medial fissure. And the dissection around the aneurysm neck is critical. A great care is required to ensure that lentil created arteries are not included in creep reconstruction. And the adequate head lotion Faculty data that is exposed to of these aneurysms that are burning beneath the lumen. Uh, so, we the answer to the question aneurysm, the post operation com computer tomogram scan showing and the ischemic events within the right internal capsule. Uh, so the injury was thought to be secondary to the incorporation of the early front branch lenticular straight artery into the creeping during reconstruction. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. Uh, Professor Wen uh, Wen Zifen shared the uh, detail of uh, anatomical consideration of early, especially early frontal branch. We've learned a lot from your lecture. Uh, we now we are open for open for the question or discussion. Any questions and the comments from the audience or web? Uh, may I ask one question, Professor? Please. Yeah, Professor Wen, uh, uh, could, could we actually differentiate uh, uh, if, if the, the hypo-dense uh, area post-surgery are due to uh, injury to the early frontal branch or due to the retraction? Can we differentiate it from the CT scan or any investigation that we can, can carry on uh, to find out the cause? Uh, see, in this is uh, uh, strand, uh, and your laser and the uh, grip, uh, sharp stripper, uh, the dober. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Any other questions? Okay, so I have a uh, long, short question. So you share the cases with nice figures of uh, lenticular striated arteries uh, arising from early frontal branch. Considering of that, uh, M1, M1 segment aneurysm, especially the aneurysm of the origin of early frontal or temporal branch may provide lenticular striated arteries. So the, at this moment, which treatment uh, is better for the aneurysm at the origin of early frontal or temporal branch? So I mean, uh, you choose a uh, clipping or endovascular coiling. Which do you prefer for the aneurysm of early frontal branch or temporal branch? Uh, I think uh, and uh, creeper maybe is a very good uh, choice and the endios uh, vascular may now have at last then they also I do mean some case and the pay uh, the uh, good uh, result so uh, now maybe I have change uh, endovascular treatment maybe so you yes. prefer endovascular surgery? Yes. No, hmm? uh, because I have atlas stand and a small uh, stand, uh, very good. But um, if if uh, on rupture, you, we can use the flow diver stand. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but in that case, we when we use the uh, Pro diabetes, so can we preserve the lenticular straight artery because uh, we put the pro diabetes on the M1 segment? So. <laughs> yes, at least very sometimes yes, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially for the <laughs> yes. unruptured cases, we are very careful about the, the infraction of the lenticular straight yes. arteries. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor, and sharing the detailed anatomy of uh, M1. And uh, we learn a lot from that. So my question is about the cases that uh, you have uh, post-operative infarct. Uh, during those cases, do you use uh, intra-op uh, ICG uh, to check the flow of the uh, vessels? And uh, is that the, during the surgery, the flow of the ICG is still uh, patent, but subsequently after the surgery, the, they're still uh, be uh, the infected area. Is, is that the case for these uh, cases? Mm, yes, the land cure straight artery is very small. And uh, ICG mm, maybe can uh, look at the very clear. So we often use ICG, but uh, land straight arteries is can't be seen. 
so so for those uh, cases, uh, the the ICG was uh, was there, the flow was there, but uh, still the brain uh, get infected after the surgery. Mm. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so the professor shares the detail of the MCA anatomy, especially focusing on early frontal or early temporal branch. Uh, thank you again for your wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you to thank Professor you. Morofuji and uh, Professor Wen for a very nice uh, presentation. So we are already uh, reaching the end of uh, today's uh, session. Uh, uh, I would like uh, to be on behalf of the Education Committee and the Professor Yoko Gato to thank both speakers, Professor Asra Fauzi and also Professor Wang Zifeng, as well as our uh, chair uh, for today, Professor Zubin and Professor Yochi Morofuji for the time and support to our SNS webinar. Uh, again, uh, I would like also express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar uh, on the WeChat channel. So until we meet again tomorrow, it's bye-bye from all of us. Thank you uh, for joining. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.